Welcome to the BFIS podcast. I recently attended the opening of a new English bookstore in Barcelona, Backstory Books. It's a magical place for book lovers and an intimate but well-stocked addition to the community and to the city's literary scene. I was lucky enough to catch writer Dinesh Theroux speaking about his wonderful young adult fantasy debut novel, Into the Sunken City. I was struck not just by the beauty of his latest story, but by the thoughtful and insightful questions some of the students who also attended the event had about the book. So when he said he'd come onto our podcast and speak with our student authors, we were thrilled. And just like me, Andrea Crenshaw, BFIS middle school English teacher and the BFIS sixth grade level leader, believes that young people with their deep and wide imaginations are some of the best writers out there. So I'd like to thank her for her enthusiasm working with our students to prepare to lead this podcast. So without further ado, I'll pass you to our middle school interview team. Hi, my name is Andrea Cranshaw and I'm a middle school English teacher at BFIS. Today we have four middle school readers and writers who are here to interview a local author. We have Stella in grade eight, Sophia in grade seven, Annika in grade seven, and Owen in grade six. Dinesh Thurer is a writer and a stay-at-home dad currently living in Barcelona. He grew up in North Carolina, married his college sweetheart from the University of Pennsylvania, and spent over a decade in San Francisco. Dinesh is half Indian, half white. He loves the ocean. He used to have other interests, but he swapped them for kids. Those kids are eight, five, and their dog. You can find him at DineshThuru.com. Thanks so much for having me here. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, Y'all, for the listeners, they prepared questions beforehand, and I was reading that doc, and there's some hard-hitting questions in there. So uh, hold on to the edge of your seats here, and we'll, we'll see if I get through the next hour. All right. So, Dinesh, what made you decide to become a writer? Any aspirations? Yeah, um, you know, I kind of stumbled into it. I was in a in a different career. I was in a marketing role. Um, I was working for this one company, Udemy, uh, for like seven or eight years. We were living in California, and we had just had our second baby, Caleb, who's in kindergarten, um, and with BFIS, and he was six months old. And I decided to leave that job and stay home with Caleb, and just thought it would be a super special experience and time for us. And when I was doing that, I started doing some journaling. I was like reflecting on life and work and being a dad. Um, and I was having a lot of fun with the journaling, and it started to turn into these little short stories. My cousin's 40th birthday was coming up around the corner. Me and that cousin have been through a lot together. We started a business together, lived together for a while. And I ended up writing this little gag book to roast him for his 40th birthday to kind of poke fun at him a little bit. My whole family like loved it. To this day, my one other cousin in uh, Berkeley still like keeps it on her coffee table as if everyone like who walk comes into her home is gonna wanna read this thing. And um, and then my, my cousin who was about, like he leaned into it and he was just the ultimate good sport. And anyway, so I was kind of like having fun with writing and then I was like, well, what if I tried to write an actual novel? What if I Turn tried, this into a career. Yeah, tried, tried to do the whole thing? Um, and I did, I wrote a full, like an, a novel is usually around 80, 90,000 words and I wrote a full thing and then I sent it out to some literary agents. I kind of, I thought it was like, okay, not great yet. And so I, I didn't want to self-publish it. I think I was like a little, little just like worried, was it good enough yet? But I thought um, maybe I could get a literary agent who could help me improve it. I didn't end up getting a literary agent, but I did have several a agents who uh, requested to read the full manuscript based on the sample chapter that I emailed them. And so at that point, I kind of felt like, oh, maybe I have like a little bit of talent here, like enough to keep going. Um, and I did keep going. I kept writing uh, several more books, like four or five books over the course of two, three years. And I eventually got a literary agent and uh, we sold the book. That was about two years ago. And then it just came out last month. Oh, that's very exciting. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And now, um, one more question on the writing process, like how you developed your book. Mm, yeah. Um, how do you overcome writer's block? 
Oh, okay. Very good question. Um, there's there's no sort of easy answer to this. I think um, everyone faces writer's block at at some point in their writing in their books. Um, for me, what I what I probably the biggest thing I try to do is just like give myself the permission to write something that isn't great you know that's kind of like okay maybe like i didn't really want this word and i was trying to think of another but i just couldn't get it or maybe like i wrote into the scene and felt like oh it's just missing that tension you know it's just it's just like not grabbing me the way it really should um but i still write it anyway and then i kind of then i'm able to look back and be like oh like this was working about that scene but this wasn't or like oh actually i was thinking that like a few chapters later it's heading this direction and i kind of forgot to start steering it toward there um, so yeah that that's my biggest thing but also sometimes you just got to like sit there and stare at the screen for a little bit you know and kind of like will the words to come out of your fingers um, yeah, do y'all find that sometimes in, in your own writing? Yeah. Or, yeah. Sometimes when I'm reading, like sometimes I'll have like a reader's block where like a scene's too tense and I'm like, I can't, I can't read this uh, right now. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that for sure. That it's like, yeah, it can, it can get very tense. Um, so we have a couple questions about craft moves. Mm -hmm. One of them is, what strategies did you use to create such a vibrant setting, especially of, like, the ocean? You created such a very detailed world. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so I should maybe give, like, a little primer on the book. Um, the book that just came out, it came out with HarperCollins. Um, it's called Into the Sunken City. Um, you can find it in Barcelona, actually, at uh, Backstory Bookshop, Owen's mom's bookshop, which is really cool. Um, and I should also do a little plug because we are having a book club coming up on Saturday, um, March 16th at Backstory Bookshop. Um, it's at it's at 5 p.m. or 5.30 p.m. You can go onto Backstory's Instagram page and find out that exact time. But um, anyway, we're going to be talking lots more about the book there. So for anyone who's read it and wants to come chat more, we'll do it. Um, the book is... Um, it's a retelling of a famous Robert Louis Stevenson book called Treasure Island. Um, and Treasure Island, it's kind of one of like the original pirate stories. It's actually like a lot of things in Pirates of the Caribbean are sort of stolen from Treasure Island. It centers on two sisters who are everything in the world to each other. Their parents are both gone. They run this inn in southern Arizona. It's in a post-apocalyptic world. So to your point on, on the ocean and the setting, sea levels have risen massively, like 4,000 feet. Um, and one fine day, a strange drifter shows up to their inn and claims to know of gold in an underwater Las Vegas. Um, so it's a big adventure story, as you all know. You've, you've uh, read um, bunches of it. For the setting... Um, I had always had this idea for like an always raining earth. I, I had just like never really seen it done before. Um, and it felt super dramatic to me. Like every every scene, like the characters are just the rains pouring down on them. Um, and that was sort of the, the original basis for the setting. And then as I tried to make the setting come to life, I tried to just think like, what are all the consequences of that? Like if it's always raining, if sea levels have gone on to, to rise even way more than they would from potential effects of climate change, although it's, it's very climate change inspired, like what would happen? And then you, you can start to play that into just like all the different aspects of world life. Um, so, you know, as an example, like it's always raining, so it's always cloudy in this world. I felt like actually satellites would start stop working and they'd get knocked out of um of earth orbit and maybe as a result like there isn't people don't really have cell phones every anymore people are more isolated i started to think like how would growing crops work like it's just going to be flooded everywhere and started to then research like what crops actually uh, grow better in environments with lower light or with like more salt because there's oceans in a lot more different places. 
Um, so anyway, so I kind of once I have like the seed of an idea, I then try to like filter it down a lot and just sort of keep playing out the consequences. So a sort of cause and effect thing. Like, if this is true, then this has to be true? Exactly, exactly. It's like, you know, yeah, another example would be like, okay, so, you know, there are clouds covering the whole Earth. They're probably not um, using much solar power anymore because light is a lot, uh, a lot less. And I started to even think, like, even oil and petroleum, they probably need that to make materials because... Um, you can't really grow trees very well in this world. <laughs> There's not really enough light to really get trees to be, be big. And then so it was like, well, petroleum still makes up a lot of our power source today. How else would they have power? But then you're sort of like, well, it's raining all the time. It's a lot of water, probably like hydroelectric power. And, uh, you know, so there's a reference at one point to Jin needing to like top up um, her inn's generator battery. And she goes to um, a hydroelectric dam in Sedona to do that. So, yeah, it's a lot of this like cause and effect, like, oh, the world's like this. Well, then that would mean that and that would mean this. And, and, and you know, you're spiraling in your head a lot, but it's kind of fun, too. Um, so another question about your craft moves is what authors, techniques, or strategies did you use and how did you use them? Mm. This is a great question. Um, I, you know, when I saw some of the questions in the Word doc, I got to confess, like I saw like related to this question was like, what literary devices do you use? Yeah. And I was very quickly like Googling literary devices and was like, oh crap, I hope I use some literary devices, <laughs> you know? Um, I, um, so in terms of author strategies and craft, um, I, I, I guess I what I realized after Googling that was like, okay, thankfully I do use some literary devices, but I'm not so like intentional. I'm not like setting out to use illusions this way or symbolism this way or like work in a motif like this. I, I, I tend to start with like a couple of broad points and then and then I kind of like let things grow organically as, a, as I write. So examples of like broad points. I knew that this book was going to be a retelling of Treasure Island. So I had an idea of like what the Treasure Island plot line was going to be. And I had this idea that instead of going to Treasure Island, as they did in the 1800s, like in this case, they're going to be going to the Treasure Island Hotel and Casino underwater in Las Vegas. So I knew that the plot line was this like heist of gold there. And I had and I had a broad arc for for how to for how to do that. I then um, another example would be like. Um, from a character perspective, how to like, what's the strategy to start figuring out who your characters are and what is their arc? Um, for that, I really like this. Um, it's it's kind of just like a simple framing for characters, which is like, what's the lie they tell themselves, and then what is the truth that they have to come to realize over the over the course of the book. Um, and so I used that when I thought about Jin. The book centers on Jin and her sister Tara, um, but it really, uh, it's Jin's story. And so her character arc had to be the strongest and it's spoken through her voice in first person. So Jin tells herself a lot of lies at the start of the book, quite frankly, you know? She, she kind of tells herself like, I can't really trust people anymore. Like her, uh, her mom passed when she was very young. Her dad died in a diving accident. She had a lot of responsibility thrust on her when she was just 15 years old, had to become the guardian for her younger sister. And she's growing up in a very tough world, right on the coast and sea levels are always rising. Their end is under threat from being underwater. So she's really in a very like survival mindset. And then you see that with how she interacts with various other characters in the book like she just doesn't trust them and so you know the the lie she tells herself is like i can't trust anyone but she has to kind of realize the truth and maybe her sister knows that truth or her ex-boyfriend knows that truth um she tells herself several different lies but anyway so i share that to say like probably my biggest author strategy is having like broad arcs of plot the kind of knowing like 
end goal and some major beats where I want to go, and then having broad arcs of uh, character development for like the learnings and how I want the character to grow. Um, and then letting a lot of the other stuff like unfurl organically as I write. Yeah. So was that one of the goals you were hoping to accomplish? Like something about like self revelation or? Yeah, totally. Great question. Um, yeah, I wanted, I, I don't know about y'all when you read, but like for me, I really like characters who are flawed, who like make some mistakes and screw things up. And, um, and so I wanted it, particularly Jin to really be that type of character, but I also wanted her to be the type of character that like, that learns and grows. And I, and I think that makes for a, for a really fulfilling character arc to, to see characters who, who grow and change uh, like that. So yeah, I don't know, do y'all you, do you like, cause some, sometimes there aren't characters like that. Sometimes there's more like the superhero character type who's just like, they always know the right thing to do. They can always like bring it at the best level. Like, yeah, how do y'all feel? No, I definitely agree with you. One of the books I'm currently reading, like at the beginning, it's like 12, books in a series but um like in the beginning she was like afraid of her own self because like her touch is lethal mm. so like she'll kill you if you touch her does this shatter me yeah yeah okay, okay so i haven't uh, read it actually but it's on my list too yeah. but definitely at the beginning she's a lot is she's scared about her own skin like mm. she's terrified about herself and then she's stuck in like an asylum so like she's talking to no one but then throughout the series, like, I'm on the third one, and she's a lot more self-confident about, about herself. Totally. Yeah, I, I love that. That's like, um, yeah, because all of a sudden that it creates all this conflict, and you, and you feel for them because they're, like, they're not quite living the life that they should be, you know? And, and you want them to get to the other side of that, so... I'm wondering if I can jump in and build upon your question to them because seventh grade just finished a realistic fiction unit and I just had the opportunity to read Annika's writing. Mm -hmm. Her story was amazing. And so Annika, what were some of the strategies that you used in order to develop your character? Um, I definitely used symbolism. I tried to use an illusion, but it didn't come off very well. And I definitely, there was one more. I forgot what it is. What what was the symbolism or what was the? There was illusion? like a dead leaf, and I compared my character to it because my character was dying. Mm. So like dead leaf. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. You know, for for me, one of the things that helps the most, I, I like I said, I was like pleasantly surprised to be like, oh wow, I do use illusions and I do use colloquialism and like you know, I was like, oh, it's in there. I am a like somewhat legitimate person, but um, I. I feel like um, what actually helps me the most to just naturally incorporate those things is just reading a lot. And um, it's like one of the books I read early on when I was kind of changing careers and becoming a writer was Stephen King's memoir um, on writing. And the two biggest pieces of advice he has in there are one, like, read a ton. A and he reads, I think, like, 70 books a year. And uh, I read, I, I can't get to 70, but I read 50. I was at dinner just the other night with someone who was saying she reads 200 books a year. You probably, did do some of y'all read North of that? <laughs> Monica, she, read, Monica. she read Keeper of the Lost Cities. That's I think there's nine books out. She read one of them in one day. Wow. Those... <laughs> I, it takes me a week to read one of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, <laughs> I don't know the last time I've read a book in a day. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, but so when you when you read that much, then like you just kind of like soak up certain things that other writers do. And I think that kind of happened to me where like like Billy, one of the characters in uh, Into the Sunken City, speaks in a very like colloquial fashion, like a lot of like strange non-traditional speech patterns right or you'll find that like a bunch of phrases like rust take me or like swamping this that are like specific to the world of this book where it's always raining 
And so I had seen some of that in other books. Like there's this one author, Brandon Sanderson, that I've read a bunch of his books, and he always has some of this stuff, like very world specific language. So I wasn't necessarily thinking to myself, like, oh, I should like get some colloquialism in here. But just reading a lot, then I was kind of like, yeah, this feels right. Like they would have some of their own manners of speech. Um, or like another one was, I've read some other retellings where they had like a quote from the original work before the book kicked off. I think it's called like epigraph or something like this. And I, I didn't even know that word quite frankly, but I had seen that done. Um, there's this author I really like, Chloe Gong. Um, she wrote These Violent Delights. Have you all ever read I have read that. Oh that yeah. It's a really okay. nice book. Yeah, you liked it? Yes. Nice. Um, so it's a Romeo and Juliet retelling in 1920s Shanghai, and there's a sickness spreading through the city. It's pretty violent sickness. Pretty brutal. Right? Yeah. Um, and she has to work together with her ex-boyfriend, who's in a rival gang, to like solve what's going on in the city. Um, but... Um, that that phrase, these violent delights, it actually comes uh, from a phrase like right at the end of Romeo and, and Juliet. I'm forgetting exactly the, the phrase that that is. But anyway, um, you know, so I, I had seen that or I read... Um, so, you know, thing, things like that kind of made me think like, oh, maybe it'd be nice to give some kind of nod to the original Treasure Island before. And then we inserted this quote, like right before chapter one, that uh, is from the original Treasure Island that says, in the immediate nearness of the gold, all else had been forgotten and kind of sets up a little bit of the mystery. So anyway, I, I think like reading a ton helps. And uh, uh, the other thing I meant I should mention from that Stephen King book, the other piece of advice he gives is to just write a lot. He write, tries to write like 2,000 words a day. And that was something I started to internalize when I was changing careers was just like, I just need to write a lot to get better. And, um, and then I started reading all these author stories, like Chloe Gong as an example. She she got published super early she got an, a literary agent when she was like 19 and then she her book came out these violent delights when she was 21 but actually she started writing when she was 12 or 13 and she wrote like five or six books and was publishing them on wattpad a uh, like self-publishing platform and so she honed her craft through all that time and that's sort of the story you tend to hear of most authors even myself is like almost everyone wrote at a minimum three books and a lot of folks wrote like seven to ten books and they had to write like 500,000 to a million words before their craft was kind of good enough to get there. Um, so I also just, I don't know if that's exactly an author strategy, but I tried to embrace that mindset like, hey, this is something that like I don't have a ton of talent on, but if I keep working, I can get better. How many times did you draft your book? before yeah. it got published? Great question, Owen. Uh, too many. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I actually wrote an entire different story in the setting of this world, and th things were mostly happening on land, and I wrote like halfway into it, and then I was just like, this is just not feeling right. And I mostly like to, like, when I start writing something, uh, take it to completion, because I think you learn a lot. That was another, like, early sort of, like, write early tip I read, was, like, you'll learn by writing the ending and fully tying out your character arcs and plot lines, etc. But I actually abandoned this one book halfway through, because I was like, I've got this future maritime earth where, like, the world's a big archipelago and everything's happening on land. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. And at that same time, I was rereading Treasure Island and I was like, oh, this this is the story to tell in this world. So uh, to your question, first, I just like wrote half of a book, which was a draft that like I just discarded completely. I then wrote this, but it wasn't quite good enough. And I like revised it a ton and then after that revision, I so maybe I wrote like two or three drafts in there. After that revision, I got my agent. With my agent then, we did another turn where she had a couple of notes on the book, was like, hey, I think this character could be a little stronger here, um, things like this. And so we did a revision. And then with my editor, 
we probably did three or four major passes on it too um where we like rewrote entire scenes or like we built out um the backstory and the vi for the villain in here as an example was like a push from my editor you know she's like i love your villain really unique the the villain like collects old sea paintings seascapes and um dives underwater to do that but she was like i think there's potential for kind of like some more revelation on his background and more mystery in that and we built that all out so i don't know seven ten drafts more uh and honestly i've probably read the book like 50 times like you have to because you go through proofreading and stuff you at a certain point uh, you're like so sick of the book you know <laughs> you're just like okay i wrote this thing i think it's decent but like i don't want to read it again but now i'm reading it to isaac my eight-year-old and um we're having a blast so and then um Speaking on revisions and proofreading, redrafting seven to ten times, that's a lot. Is there anyone specifically, like family, friends, who feedbacks or critiques your writing to mm. help you improve it? Yeah. Um, my wife's read the book like five or six times. And uh, a few weeks ago, she was then like, I'm thinking about listening to the audiobook, you know? And I, I was just like, You're out of your mind. <laughs> like, you, like yeah, like this. I, I uh, anyway, that, that, that's been amazing. And she, she's kind of my original editor and just provides like incredible feedback every time. Um, I actually, because it was a career change, I don't have a ton of like writer friends, um, but I worked with like with beta readers, folks I met online who could give me some some feedback on the work. Um, and that was definitely really helpful. Like one one other thing I like read or heard like early on was like when you're first starting out as a writer, usually you've read a lot. And so as a result, like, your taste is pretty good like you're you're able to really like critique your own work and think like oh yeah this this isn't working and and maybe you can't always find the solutions but like you know you can go over your stuff and come up with like i should work on this i should work on this but your craft isn't there so it's essentially like you have to keep writing so that your craft catches up with your taste. I realize I'm doing a bunch of like hand signals right now and we're on a podcast. Um, anyway, hopefully the point gets across. Um, and so I felt like in the early times of, of kind of becoming a writer, I was able to sort of self-critique a lot and mm -hmm. do that pretty well and didn't need as much from friends or family and other writers. But then I also reached a point where like, I just had blind spots on things and that I wasn't seeing. And you need to publish it, yeah. so. And yeah, I'm still really thankful to my editor, my first editor, Kristen, who just, she like improved me tremendously as a writer. Um, we like, uh, yeah, I, I think about some of the feedback she's given me like um, almost daily. Like there's this one comment she left in the manuscript where she is like, have Jin reveal something here that she'd never tell anyone. And it was like, I, I think about that comment most times when I'm writing a book because it's just like, it is such a powerful way to have your characters like be vulnerable and really show their true emotions. Um, anyway, so there are just kind of things like that where I've, I've learned a lot from other folks. Um, I have a question that wasn't in the doc, mm. but I'm going to ask it anyway. Let's do it, I'm um, going off doc. How do you start your book? I've always had problems starting because sometimes it just not doesn't fit. Yeah, great question. Um, I guess, so when you start, do you have like characters in mind and like plot in mind already? Or do, or do you just have like a little nugget and go? Like, yeah, how? I do. But sometimes the beginning just doesn't seem to fit the rest of the story, mm -hmm. or it seems too short, too long, too descriptive, not descriptive enough or something. Yeah, it's a great question. Beginnings are really hard, and this is something, is like I see so many writers talk about this too. They'll like, they have trouble getting the beginning going, and then they also, like, they obsess over the beginning. It's even something I do. Like, you, you're maybe like a third into the book, but you keep going back and like rewriting the beginning, you know? And you just want it to be like perfect. 
and um, and quite frankly, it's like it can't be perfect yet because you you haven't written the ending. You like almost inevitably when I get to the end, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go back and tweak the beginning a little bit to be like this. Um, for me, when I start, I usually have a like rough outline. I'm talking like I know roughly from a plot perspective where I want it to end, and I. Um, and I know some of the major beats. Maybe I even have like a rough little paragraph per chapter, but that's not not always. And then I have an idea for the type of character who's going to be the main character in the story. And then I try to pick a scene, like an opening scene for that character. Or and it doesn't necessarily have to happen in that first chapter, but I try to pick something that both like showcases their their daily life but also is leading to pivotal moment for them or is leading to some moment that's kind of like things are going to change for them like this thing is coming or happening and all of a sudden like they're not going to be the same you know, like an example in in hunger games is um the what's it called the not tribunal the, the reaping the reaping exactly yeah the reaping is coming and so you're um, you're in Katniss's daily life she goes into the woods and Gail is there and this is what she does she hunts and you kind of are learning about her daily life and and how evil the capital is but then you also know the reaping is coming and once that comes like there's probably going to be something that uh, is is going to just shift her life forever and, and it does so I try to have this a little bit, and that was kind of the way I started with Into the Sunken City, was like, okay, let's have an event that showcases Jin's daily life. She's at the inn, there are these underwater worlds, she doesn't have a lot of money, and she's trying to figure out how to put money together. But also then this person shows up that you kind of realize is going to just completely change her and her sister's life, and then that person is Billy. But I don't just mean the starting scene, I also mean the starting sentence. Ooh. I think the one for the Hunger Games is like, I reach out to the side of the bed yeah. seeking Prim's War yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, great, great memory on that too. I um, The Hunger Games is interesting. I remember like kind of studying it when I was first, first writing and a lot of folks say that like, basically the way the Hunger Games start, you should try not to start, which is essentially with like, a character waking up to their day they're like you should try to kind of like grab the reader with something a little less traditional but the hunger games is the hunger games and can get away with this type of stuff right but that being said i i mean i guess i would come back to like owen's question on the writer's block i i essentially try to like give myself permission to just not get it exactly right so even if i'm kind of like okay that first line it's just not flowing exactly the way I'd want it to. I'm sort of like, you know, I'll, I'll let myself think about it a little bit because first lines are first lines and you're right. They're like, they're super important and they can dictate a lot. I have this one work in progress book with a really like creepy main character. And the first line I ever wrote was a pretty creepy first line and like ended up like helping me to really explore who this character was and all the lies that he's telling himself anyway so i'll give it a bit of thought but then i'll also be like you know what you have some other idea for like what this first scene is going to look like just just write something and let things kind of unfurl and you can come back to it yeah does that resonate or do you do you do any of that or do you tackle it differently well um i try to describe my setting at the beginning mm, that's good yeah there is uh Okay, so very specifically to your point, yeah, there are different schools of thought on that. There are some folks who like to, they like to have the character's voice be like super present right up front in the novel. I, li I like this quite a bit too. Um, so like a good example, anyone ever read The Fifth Wave? It's an alien invasion book. You're either. basically like listing all the books that are in our dystopian unit of study so far. Amazing, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's awesome. I, uh, dystopian unit of study, I'm going to have to come in to sit in on class. Love that. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, that's our eighth, one of our eighth grade unit of study. So Stella actually did the Shatter Me series yes, for her like unit. That. And nice. then we also have other titles like Hunger Games and Fifth Wave yeah. and, of course, Divergent and yeah. Arc of the Scythe. Scythe. Oh, Scythe yes. is great. I love Scythe. Yeah. yeah. I, so Fifth Wave, I think the first line in that book is, aliens are stupid. 
and it just grabs you right away you know it's like punchy it's got a point of view and I, I think it goes on to be like but I don't mean the others like the others are so much far beyond where humans are you know and then you're just sort of intrigued and you're like what is this person talking about exactly so there's sort of like some folks start with voice a little bit is is maybe a one way to put it and i actually have some of that in into the sunken city where the first line is i swore to myself i'd never do this again and so you you immediately feel some kind of like okay this is like a character of conviction but they're conflicted and they've got but they have a strong point of view about whatever's coming but i also <laughs> Uh, lots of books, and I tried to maybe split the difference uh, here, where, to your point, they start off with more like sensory, your five senses, sight, sound, touch, uh, taste, hearing, and like hit those hard in that first few lines, essentially, and use really like active verbs, right? Not saying like, you know, it was raining, but like, a, like in the the second line for Into the Sunken City is rain ripped down on a diagonal, battering the bay and the floating three slip and our floating three slip dock. So it's like with this, it's rain ripped. Ripped is the verb that's more active as opposed to was falling is like a more passive style of describing it. And it's more sensory because you can almost like hear this, right? Like battering the bay. Um, so yeah anyway so what you're saying on like describing a scene and doing that in a rich sensory way is also an incredible way to start a book uh, yeah. yeah sounds like you already know how uh, <laughs> oh i don't um <laughs> the how, are your characters based on anyone you know or like yeah family friends yeah great question oh and there's no there's no one where it's like oh, okay this this character is this person um but what i've kind of realized realized especially since the book's coming out has been that like a lot of like little attributes either of myself or of like family friends have worked their way into the novel you know so like as an example my dad called me the other day and was like finish the book and like i kept thinking about us when all these scenes with Jin and her dad and like that was it was really like cool meaningful conversation for me but he also said he's like you know you remember that one scene where you're describing the dad and he does this like half smile where he covers up half of his face with his mouth so he's smiling but you can't see the whole smile it's like I realized I do that you know and I hadn't like thought as I was describing Jin's dad that it's like oh this is my dad's like smile thing that he does and I'm gonna put this into the book but he's totally right he does that and that must have just been bouncing around in my head somewhere and then I put that in to the character so it's like think, things like you know parts of the family and friends or just who you are like they work their way in into the characters for sure and then I believe you mentioned in the beginning that the story arc followed some sort of character development mm -hmm. on Jin's part mm -hmm. just out of curiosity is this book written in third person narration or first person narration? It's first person. I I like to write in first person a lot because I feel like I can really get into the head of the character. Um, and I just, I find that fun. It enables me to like, to really kind of get their motivations and get who they are a, a, like pretty deeply. Um, but also, I see plenty of books that are written in third person, um, particularly, so there's two types of third person. There's third person limited, which means like, you are in third person, you're describing everything as like, Jin stepped onto the boat, Jin like ran across the yard, as opposed to I did that, right? Um, but you are limited only to that person's point of view. Um, so third person limited. There's also third person omniscient where you're sort of like an all knowing narrator and you just between sentences can jump into the heads of any characters that you're with and immediately know what they're thinking. Um, anyway, so in third person limited as well, I think you can 
still really be in the head of the character. And there's some advantages to third person limited too, uh, particularly if you want to have multiple points of view. Sometimes for readers, it can be a little jarring to have multiple points of view, like this chapter centers on this character and this chapter centers on another when they're all in first person. To do that, you have to have like a really unique voice per character, and it can sometimes be a little hard to pull off. What about for y'all? Do you write in first person or third person or? Um, usually first person. First. Um, Same. But the thing you said about like the character switching that happens in Percy Jackson, and that kind of connects to one of the questions I was going to ask you. Mm. Um, so like the first question is: Is it possible there's a second book? And if there is. Would it be not in Jin's perspective? Would it be in like Thara's or something? Great question. Yeah. So I think his dad actually like brought this up with me too. So it's so funny. I, I so I've now like heard this multiple times. Um, so we haven't sold a second book yet. I have some ideas for essentially like I have an outline for a second book, and I have some ideas for sort of where like uh, you know a two or three books might go um and uh, you know there's some mysteries in the world that need to be solved etc um i hadn't actually originally been thinking that like a second book might be from a different character's perspective but i think it's pretty cool idea and you do see that sometimes in um in series so yeah so i, I think it's really interesting and something that if my publisher comes to me and says like yeah we want to do a second book i'm gonna um i'm gonna give it a lot more thought yeah. you if you did do a second book but in a different character's perspective would you try to do like a different story or have the character's perspective on the same story i think it would still be the same the same overall story that i'm trying to tell yeah it would it would be a character that's in into the sunken city that we've already met that's kind of on the journey that they're all on but yeah but it's something i've seen occasionally in reviews where folks have like they've liked Jin and they've liked being on her journey but they've also been interested in like learning more about some of the other characters so um yeah that that's a great question and it's i've mostly been focused on some of these other books that that i have written that we're hoping to sell this year but if we come around to doing a sequel i want to i want to give that a lot more thought yeah um i want to ask a question about the ending of your story mm. Because uh, in my no spoilers story, though. I try to have my thing represent like the journey the characters made, like them saying something they've never done, mm. they never do, like at the beginning. Mm. Was yours sort of like that? Because it was what's the job, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Jin was going to die, do the diving for that lady. Mm -hmm. Um, I let's see so for readers i don't i don't want to give spoilers on like how the ending goes exactly but i will say i think what you are talking about of like making sure the ending ties out with the beginning is really important and i specifically think it's powerful to do that from a uh like if you think of like the two major lines through a book are like the plot line or the character arc line um i think it's really powerful to do that from a like character arc perspective to show that like hey uh, you know after all the course of the events of uh this book in my case after this big adventure and, and journey that they've been on like how did Jin's mindset change what she learned and so i tried to have some of that in those closing paragraphs to really demonstrate like you know uh, like like i said about the like you know these were the lies that she's been telling to herself when she first started the novel kind of things that like that that just aren't quite right like another lie she tells herself is essentially like i need to be so focused on taking care of my sister that i can't really even want anything for myself you know i can't really i almost can't even have my own goals or desires i just have to give that up and just help my sister get through this but like that that's not right right like everyone deserves to like have something that's theirs have have like something that that they want that um that's important to them so i tried to show some of that as well and uh, yeah and so i think it's important at, that that ending ties out with the beginning of where the character is well 
Um, it, there's that part in the book where after she thought, uh, finds out she was diving mm-hmm. and then gets mad at her. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jin is like so wrapped up in keeping herself out of the Navy that she forgot that one year, like, Thara would have to be kept out of the yeah. Navy as well. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think this is why Jin's a very flawed character. Right. It's like she does care a lot about her sister, but she also just has a lot of her own like fears and trauma. She's so scared of diving because she was with her dad when he passed away in this accident that even though she cares a lot about her sister, she kind of fails to realize that like going on this adventure, doing this dive could really change her sister's life, too. And so um, I like characters like that because they're kind of they're kind of complex. And I think they're they're more like who we are. Um, But you're absolutely right that that's like, you know, that doesn't line up exactly to like, yeah, Jin is always making the right decision for her sister. Like she's not she's trying to, but she's also just got a lot of her own fears and traumas that are sort of preventing her from doing that. Um, I have a question, so I'm going to say the pretty one, so mm-hmm. I don't spoil oh, sure, sure, yeah. But, um, I am midway through the book, so I don't know if you give more on her backstory, mm-hmm. but is it possible that you would write, like, a short story about her backstory? That's cool, yeah. Um, a little bit more about her backstory comes out, for sure. Um, but, yeah, she she's just a super fun character uh someone described to me i was on this other podcast with an author who had like read the book the author uh, marissa meyer who's got the like quote on the front and she was like that character is just like a splash of color on every page you know and was like you know especially in your like rather bleak world where the clouds are covering the sky and where everything's pretty gray Um, So anyway, I think there's a lot of love for The Pretty One, and I think that's a cool idea. And I do see that done in some series, too, where there'll be like a novella um, or, yeah, short stories that folks will do kind of centered on a different character. So, yeah, I like that idea. Thanks so much for being on our podcast today. We've enjoyed speaking with you, and we'd love to invite you to speak with our students in class one day. Ah, thanks. Yeah, this has been so much fun. I super appreciate y'all for having me. And um, yeah, I I think we have some plans for me to come to the school. So that's going to be really, really cool.